I've given my life not to a dead Christ, but to a living Christ. I know where I've come from. I know why I'm here. I know where I'm going. Do you? Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. And lo, I will be with you even until the end of the world. Well, welcome all of you, all of our campuses, all of you watching online here at Frisco East. And, and uh, I mean, how many feeling good today? I know, uh, I know the Cowboys are, are with us today, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, and we, our heart goes out to them, love them. But it's good to see you. And uh, we're going to dive into the series in just a second. But anytime in our country, <clears throat> that, you know, this month we started praying for our country and our states. We've got four states that we're praying for now. We're in alphabetical order. And, and then obviously our country, our leaders, we're praying for them. And, and then this week, obviously, if you're, if you're not praying or if you haven't thought about it, Memphis, the community of Memphis and the community of Half Moon Bay in California and the families that are involved in the shootings and, and the, the, the death, uh, you know, it's, it's when will it end, but we pray and we ask God to be with them. And, and, and this is a good teaching moment for us uh, if you have a family, if you have kids, um, uh, you know, th- that compassion and love and grace and, and anxiety and, you know, all those things that, that have to, to do with um, human, the human race and, and, and that God came to put us back together in a whole place. And so I encourage you to pray for our country in that way as well as we're praying for our leaders and, and our states. And um, don't forget men's conference, guys. Man, uh, what's one of my favorite things of the year? And we've moved it up this year. It's usually, yeah, thank you. One, one, of, one, of, one of us likes it. It's good. Me and, me and you, whoever you are, come on, come on. Um, so it's a good thing. And then next week, next week, we start a little bit early our Lent series uh, up to Easter, we're going to start uh, a series on the book of John and uh, a cast of characters right there. We're going to look at all of the characters that Jesus encountered in the book of John, uh, leading right up to the cross, leading right up to Easter. So it's going to be a great series. That starts next week. Excited to start that. But today, we're going to finish up a series called Revival. And depending on how you grew up in the church in which you may have come from, or maybe you didn't come from church, revival has many thoughts. We have many thoughts about it. We have things that come to our mind. Maybe you're in the Billy Graham era and, and those crusades, and uh, maybe in the hippie Jesus movement in the 60s and 70s. Maybe you're a little older, uh, whatever. There's, there have been many movements in our country and, and around the world for that matter, but what, what would God want to do today? What does God want to do today in our lives? And in revival, first week, we talked about some R words in, in this whole series. We talked in the first week about return, return to God. We talked about Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And some of us have lost our first love. Some of us are lukewarm. We're neither hot nor cold. Some of us once were alive, but now we're dead. We talked about this returning to God, and then I gave you the definition of revival. And I say the definition, my definition of revival. And and here's what what I think about revival as it pertains to us here at Hope. When a group of believers simultaneously, when all of us together, praying for the same thing, ask God for a supernatural transformation of our lives. You remember, we, we get a piece of chalk, we draw a circle around us, and we ask God to bring revival to that circle. And that's where revival starts. It starts with me. It starts with us and returning to God. And what that brings in our lives and then in a group of people is conviction, contrition, and repentance of sin, a renewed awareness of God's presence, a hunger for God's word, a compassion for the lost, and a humility to love and serve the body of Christ. Last week, or two weeks ago, we talked about refresh and our spiritual lives. We talked about that, that whole idea that once we were alive, but, but now um, we're dead. There's some things that need to be uh, renewed or refreshed in us. 
Uh, last week, we talked about restoring our heart for people. Lost people matter to God. If they matter to God, they matter to me, and they should matter to us. Today, I want to talk about renew your commitment to the local church. Um, you know, I know I'm going to say some things today, just like you may be passionate about something. Uh, maybe that's cancer awareness for some reason. There's somebody in your family or, or you or a cancer survivor, and, and you're very passionate when you talk about that. Some of us, maybe it's pets. We, we love animals, and, and we're passionate about uh, SPCA or you know, some kind of saving of the whales or you know, whatever. I'm making fun of that. I'm just saying some of us are really passionate about some motorcycles. You know, I'm passionate about motorcycles. You start me talking about motorcycles, man, I'll talk to you 30, 30 minutes right in the lobby, so come see me. But... <laughs> But what I'm really passionate about is the local church. And, and I know that I'm going to say some things that I'm, I am super passionate about, and you may not be as passionate about, but you should be. So that's why I'm here, to help you, to help you get better, right? Uh, not just get better, to, begin, to, 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 to get this right. And when we can get this right between us and God, and we can get this right, I'm telling you, revival, movements start this way and this way. So uh, many of you know my story. Um, some of you don't. <clears throat> I was raised in church, but, but before that, um, I was adopted when I was three days old. Uh, it's a great story. I won't go into that story, but, but my, my mom and dad, Eddie and Pat McKenzie, who adopted me, didn't tell anybody months leading up to my birth. They didn't tell a soul. They were part of this church that I was raised in, not a big church, 150 at the most, 100 to 150 was my church growing up. And um, they made the nursery, this, this, my bedroom that I grew up in, um, they closed the door when anybody came over. They didn't tell any of their church friends. They didn't tell any of the family. They didn't tell anybody in case something happened, in case something fell through. They just kept it to themselves, which is kind of a miracle. But Three days after I was born, September 3rd, 1966, um, the church family that they were a part of, they were, there was a big party going on that night. And uh, they were all at this house, and they were supposed to be there. Um, but I came home, and, and so the hospital delivered me, and so they put me in the nursery, and then they called the party that was going on. Right? All the, there's probably 30 or 40 people at this party, including kids, and they called Joyce and Dan Miller and they said, hey, we want y'all to come over. And how many, you know, if you're hosting a party and you're just like, what? Um, what? This is so weird. But it was 66, right? So they did weird things in 66. <laughs> so the whole party came over to our house. And they opened the door and there that beautiful, handsome little baby <laughs> was there. Um, all of those people were at that party were the people I grew up with all my life. Um, same church all my life. We, two different buildings. Uh, we were at, in, a, in a church in Combs, Texas, down in the Rio Grande Valley, and then, then Harlingen, Texas, but the same group of people. And uh, this was a group of people that I was raised with. Uh, we went on vacations with to to the hill country. We had campers and we all went to the Frio River and Garner State Park and every year, every year was a tradition. I grew up with them. I can tell you every Sunday school teacher I ever had, Miss Cannon, Dan Miller, Bill Poole, Joyce Miller, Thalma Barr, John Kilgore, um, Betty Bryant, Lillian Woody, my mom. Can you imagine that? Your own mom, your Sunday school teacher. Um, <clears throat> she, she did a lot in those days and, and, and uh, uh, man, I had so many great Sunday school teachers. I'll never forget them. Lonnie Perry, Dave Luan, Mark and Evelyn Anderson, youth leaders, Don and Laria Thornton, Mark, Chuck Myers, Jim Slack, my mom again. Um, man, it was, it, was a, it, it was an important time of my life, obviously, but there was something powerful that happened, and it wasn't, listen, it wasn't a, the best church in the world. It, great pastors, man. Um, I remember some great pastors, Ron Bowen, um, Jerry and Kelly Morgan, um, Brother Meyer. I mean, so many great, Brother Woody, oh my goodness, huge impact in my life. They were great pastors, not necessarily 
uh, visionary leaders, but they were really, really good pastors. And all of these events that I'm talking about, VBS and youth camps and, and mission trips and choir trips that we took, I mean, all of those things are the reason why I'm here today. In fact, in 2005, when we opened our first building, Hope Fellowship opened our first building in 2005, those people that I just mentioned, Dan and Joyce Miller, Bill and Barbara Poole, uh, John and Leota Kilgore, my mom and dad who weren't living at the time uh, here, they were living in the valley, they all came up at our grand opening. And to this day, some have passed away, but to this day we all keep in touch. And, and, it, and it, it's the reason, let me just say this clearly, it is the reason why I'm here today. The group of people that I was raised with are the reason why I'm here. I had great teachers in school. I had, I had great um, uh, coaches in, in school. But the church family, the local church, is the reason why I'm here. Now, I understand that not everybody has that story. But before you think I had this euphoric church and, and this like perfect life, let me put something on the screen. Despite all the challenges, and listen, there were challenges in our church. There were hurts in our church. There were disappointments. And it was messy. Let me just tell you, there were, I mean, there were weird things that happened. We'd vote out pastors if we didn't like the color of their tie or something. It felt like that. It wasn't really the reason. But we it was in the day, right, where you could vote out pastors. You can't do that today. So... <clears throat> Now, you can leave, but you can't vote me out. The, the board and elders can, but, but you can't. All right, so we voted pastors out. We, I remember business meetings that were crazy. Fights, I mean, so, so when I say the local church is the reason why I'm here, it's despite the challenges, the hurts, the disappointments, and the messiness, because it was messy. No wonder our church didn't grow. No, no wonder our, our church wasn't a, a, an influence in our city. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way because I have my friends that listen and, and that were in that church, and you know I love you, but you know what I'm saying is true. We didn't have an influence in that city because there were many challenges, hurts, disappointments, and it was messy. But good things, really good things happen in the church. And I'm so glad that my mom and dad didn't leave when it got challenging or it got hurtful or disappointed. They were disappointed or it got messy. I'm glad they didn't leave. I'm glad they just stayed. And there were many, there were many times in which I, as a high school student, watching things happen, I thought, man, we should get out of here. But we just stayed and, and we stuck to it. And, and because of that, I'm not saying, so don't hear me say it's not always wrong to leave a church. There are many reasons to, good reasons to leave a church, but that's not my point today. My point is that Jesus said in Matthew 16 that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. It doesn't mean that it has to look like this church. Our culture is different than the first century, of course. And, and it doesn't mean that, that in, in 100 years or 1,000 years that this church will look the same or that church in general will look the same. But he said, I will build my church into the group of people who meet together, who come simultaneously praying that God would transform their lives and help them to reach people far from God. So despite the challenges, and you may be here today, and you don't have that church story, you have a very different church story, very abusive, very hurtful, whatever, right? And I totally get that. But with all the challenges and all the hurts and all the disappointments, even the abuse, Good things, really good things happen in the local church. Acts 2, verse 42, says it this way, and all the believers devoted themselves. This is the first church. This is the very first church that Jesus said he would build. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, 
all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. There was influence. There was vision. There was devotion. There was commitment. There was influence in their city. They turned their world upside down. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Now, what, 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 if, what if that were to happen here? What if we, together, we're praying that God, somehow, some way, in my circle, would you move in my heart? Would you renew? Would you restore? Would you refresh? Would you help me to return to you to transform me? And so that, and in that transformation, you're working through me. Jesus, in his Last Supper, at the end of that whole supper, he says this in John 13. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Notice that he doesn't say your love for everyone. Your love for the lost or your love for Roman citizens, your, your love for Greek citizens, your, your, your love for the world. No, it says your love for each other. And that's, you know, for 2,000 years, we have struggled with this, haven't we? We struggled with loving one another. We struggled with forgiving one another. And one of the reasons why my local church, even though I am so grateful, <clears throat> I am so grateful for my local church. But here's the deal. Let me put it on the screen. We will never have much influence in this world if we can't become the church Jesus said he would build, a church that loves one another. They will know that we are believers because we love one another. There is, a, there is something spiritually powerful that happens when we come together to worship. There, there's something that, that happens when we come together in unity, how good and pleasant it is when, when brothers and sisters get together in unity, and, and there, it doesn't mean uniformity. It doesn't mean that you have to worship or like my kind of or style of worship. There are many churches in our city that I love that have pipe organs and pianos and choirs. It doesn't have to be this. This is cooler, but it doesn't have to be. <laughs> I'm not kidding, actually. Some sing out of hymn books, some sing off the screen. I mean, th that's not what I'm talking about. It's not uniformity, but there is a unity. There's a love. And, and many of the pastors that I get together with every month here in the city that I love, I don't agree with all their theology. They don't agree with mine, all of it. But there is a, a respect. There is a healthy um, love for one another because we are the church. And, and here at Hope, here at Hope, man, we all agree on everything, Right? Everything I teach, you agree with. I love it. I'm kidding. But it, despite the diversity in, in the sense of theology or even style preferences, we have chosen to worship together, to simultaneously ask God to transform our circle. And then when thousands and thousands of people across our campuses ask God to transform their circle, guess what happens? A movement. Something happens in our, in our area, and of, and of all the people that are moving to this area from all over the country, there's a stewardship responsibility that we have to not just say us four no more, but to just say, God, how can we as the church become the church that Jesus would build? There's a scripture that I want to go to today, and, and I'm not going to be long. I'm going to be, I'm going to be rather quick today, but, but I, I want to go to this scripture, and I want you to think of hope the church that we're a part of here, as I read every line of Romans chapter 12. I'm going to start with verse 9, and let's read, thinking of our church. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. And take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. 
And listen to this one. Don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone, so when people in our community see us here at Hope, they see McKinney Campus, they see Prosper Campus, they see our West Campus, they see us here at East, so that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live with, in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. <clears throat> In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. What if we, what, what if that passage right there described us to a T? Nobody's going to be perfect. We're not going to be perfect in this. But what if we were more like this than anything? It's difficult and it's messy, right? Church is messy. Home groups are messy. Small groups are messy. People are weird. You know what I'm saying? You get into a small group, get ready. It's weird. Sometimes. Not mine, but probably yours. And if you don't think it's weird, everybody else in the group thinks you're weird. <laughs> right? I'm just saying, you get into Sunday school class, whatever form of discipleship and growth... But when you get people together, it's different. People come from different places and different ways of doing things, traditions and, and personalities, and, and sometimes it's weird and sometimes it's, it's, it's uncomfortable. Can I just tell you that's life? That's in every organization. That's in every team. That's in every workplace. People are weird. We're weird. All of us are, some, some have, you know, not all of us, but, but a lot of us have little weird things that we do and say and think and overshare, you know, first meeting and you're sharing your whole sinful life and it's like, oh, hey. <laughs> you ever been in one of those? Somebody has. It's like, <laughs> sin I committed yesterday. It's, oh, it's like, whoa. But what, what if... What if we looked past the weirdness and we looked past the, the uncomfortable things that happen in church? And it's not just church, though. Again, it's every organization. Every organization has weird things. And there are hurtful things that you and I have been through together, some of you. Some of you I've known for 30 years. Some of I've, I've known ever since we started this church, 23 years. And I've not been perfect. And you have allowed for my weaknesses. You have allowed and you've forgiven me. And I've forgiven you. And, and it goes back and forth. That's what community is about. That's what this church is about. They devoted themselves. And, and, and God added to their fellowship those who were being saved. And when we love, really, really love one another with genuine affection, and we pray for those who persecute us when we're hurt, when we're misused, when we're left out, we pray for them. We bless them. We feed those who are hungry. We show hospitality. We mourn with those who mourn, and we rejoice with those who rejoice. What if we endeavored to live like that? Guys, I want to challenge you in 10 ways. You ready? I'm going to be quick. I want to challenge you in 10 ways. Move from spectator to servant. Many of us, we just watch. You, you watch the band. You watch us. You watch the workers. You watch the child, uh, the, the children who work with children. You watch them volunteer. You watch the student ministry volunteer. You watch the parking lot. You watch everything. But, but I'm going to ask you, what if it's time for you to become a servant? What if it's time for you to, to wash feet? Jesus said, wash each other's feet. They will know that you're my disciples when you love one another. I mean, this is not a recruitment thing. This is just, this is, this is a, a challenge. That if, if we're gonna become the church that Jesus said he would build, there's some things that have to happen in order for that to happen. And, and one of those is we have to move from spectator to servant. The second one is we move from disconnected to connected, many of us. And I understand there's good reason to be disconnected, especially when you've had a bad experience in the place that you came from. And there's a time, listen to me closely, there is a time of healing. There's no question about that. There's a time of just getting to know us. Is this where God wants you? 
And I understand, listen, I hate to say this, but I understand that hope is not for everyone. I understand that. And if, and if you know that already, come, I'll be in the lobby after service. I, I've got great friends around this area. I can point you in a great direction for a church that might fit you if you tell me what you're looking for. But man, maybe this is your church, but you're disconnected. Maybe it's time for you to get connected. It's time for us to move from uncommitted to committed. Many of us, just to be honest, the only time we show up is when we serve. And you know I love you, right? This is not a legalistic thing, but the only time we come to church two times a month or so is when we serve. The other times, we just kind of stay at home, kind of relax. And I'm just challenging you, that's not, and, and again, this is not a legalistic thing, this is just, I'm challenging you, us, should I say, to not just be regular, to not just do what is comfortable to you, but to, to move from uncommitted to committed, even if you're not serving, even if you're not, you don't have a responsibility. Can I just tell you that we need you, and, and actually you need us. The body of Christ fit together, move from receiver to investor. Many of us just we just take, we just take, we just take. Maybe it's time to invest. We move from disillusion to heal. Many of us have been disillusioned in church, and, and, and rightfully so. Maybe there's some bad things that have happened, and I know bad things have happened in churches. But what if God was saying, hey, I want to heal you. I want to take that disillusionment. I want to take that hurt. I want to take that abuse. I want to take that frustration and I want to bring healing to you so that you can be healthy to do what I've called you to do in the local church. We move from bitter to forgiver. And I just tell you, many of us are bitter at our ex-husband, ex-wife. We're bitter at somebody at our last church. We're bitter towards people for some reason at work, friendships. Can I just tell you the only, per well, the, the one real person that's hurting in that is you. You're not really hurting them, you're hurting you. What if we move from bitterness to, to forgiver? What if we move from divided to unify? You're not gonna, we're not gonna agree on everything. We're just not. But what if we just decided to put aside our preferences as long as we're good on theology, as long as we're teaching and preaching the gospel, man, some of those preferences can go away, can be put aside, in other words, and we move from a dis, you know, it's kind of divided, kind of a, a, a place that is not in harmony to a place that is unified, and we move from self-absorbed to us-absorbed, many of us. We really are self-absorbed with our families, and I want you to hear me. I know you know I love family. I love my family. I got four kids, two grandkids. Love them. But many of us are self-absorbed with our families, and it gets in the way right here. We're so worried about their deal. We're so worried about their activities, and, and we miss what God wants to do in them. We're 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 we're, we're putting them in things that take them away from the things of God. And I say this not in a legalistic way, but we're doing this and, it, and it, it concerns me that we're more interested in them becoming a, a, a pro in sports or some academic genius than we are a disciple. I'm gonna, I'm gonna preach it. Self-absorbed, absorbed. And then we move from distracted to focused. What if we were all just focused on, on who God wants us to be and who God wants us to be? What if we move from temporary thinking to eternal thinking? And it was really, honestly, I'm going to give you this, I'm going to send this to you by email. But, and I, again, none of these are meant to be legalistic. I'm not trying to get you in a headlock and make you feel bad, you know, because, because you're not committed, <laughs> although you need to get committed. Uh, these, these, I mean, you can still go to heaven and not do many of these things. But, but what I'm saying is, in, in this revival series, what if we just decided to move from where we are to a better place? To a better place this way. 
we got this thing going on and we got this. We're returning to God. We're refreshing our spiritual lives. But then we're restoring our passion for the lost and we're renewing our passion for the local church. What, what would happen if this way got right? And they were all moving in the same direction. We were all praying for the same thing, that God transform me so that you can work through me. And I, I can't think of a better way to end this series than with this statement. You ready? Think what the local church would be like if all its people were radically devoted to Jesus Christ irrevocably committed to each other and relentlessly dedicated to reaching those outside of the family of God. It would be a church against which the gates of hell would not prevail. This sums up what I've been teaching this whole month. Radically devoted to Jesus, irrevocably committed to each other. Love God, love your neighbor and then relentlessly dedicated to reaching those outside of the family of God. That's the kind of church that Jesus wants to build. That's the kind of people that make a difference, start movements in our area, calling people back to God, back to the gospel, back to serving and loving one another and making him the priority of our lives rather than our families or our career or money. What if, what if God's people, what if Hope's people were radically devoted to Jesus, irrevocably committed to each other, relentlessly dedicated to reaching those outside the family of God? He wants to do it. So I want you to take the communion packet that you received when you came in and <clears throat> I want you to get that piece of bread out and get the cup ready all across our campuses. If you didn't get one, would you just raise your hand real high? Just real high, raise it and you'll be served across all of our campuses. What a great way for us to end this series. And I want to talk to you just a minute about the bread and the cup. We all know that it symbolizes the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. His obedience his sacrifice, his obedience, his sacrifice. But you know who else is referred to as the body of Christ? Not a trick question. We are. Romans, Romans tell, talks to us about, or 1 Corinthians, sorry, 1 Corinthians 12 talks to us about some of us are hands and some of us are feet. Some of us are eyes, some of us are ears. But the ear can't say to the mouth, I don't need you. And the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. But we need each other. And so when we take communion, oh, no, and I am not taking away from the body and the blood of Jesus. This is the body and the blood of Jesus by symbolism. But we're also the body of Christ. And so when we take this, let's commit to one another. And if this is not your church, commit to your church. But that let's commit to one another to be the body of Christ that he's called us to be. Messy, hurtful, disappointing, challenging, frustrating as it can be. But Jesus said, I will build my church and I wanna be a part of that. So as we take the Lord's Supper, thanking him for his obedience to the cross and thanking him for his sacrifice that makes us right with God, Let's also think of our commitment to one another. Lord, you are so good. And you have not just called us to be right with you. You've called us to love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. And that is messy and that is hard. It takes a lot of work. The kind of work that you gave on the cross, sacrificing obediently to make us right with God. So today we take this bread and we drink this cup remembering what you've done for us, but also committing to be the body of Christ that you've called us to be. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Let's take the bread together. Let's take the cup together. May your kingdom come. May your will be done in our hearts, in our lives, in this church, as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.